This is Ecclesiastes for Beginners, lesson number 11. And the title of this one is Comments on the Rat Race. Ecclesiastes chapter nine. We're going to start at chapter nine. So Solomon has been sharing the fruit of his hard-won wisdom. After living apart from God, he returns and he notes some of the things that he has learned concerning wisdom itself. You know, he's learned about things in life. Life lived under the sun, life lived apart from God, but he's also learned things about wisdom, the qualities of good leadership. He's also learned several basic principles upon which one's life must be based in order to succeed. And we talked about that in the last uh, lesson. In the passages that we're going to do today, the writer will provide more advice on how to live life and how to deal with certain people in our lives. Once Solomon stopped using his wisdom for strictly worldly pursuits, he now focuses it on the simple art of living and how one can succeed during the brief time he has here, um, here on earth. Now we think that the idea of the rat race is a 21st century phenomenon. We think, oh, that didn't happen back in the day. That didn't happen back in ancient times. You know, the rat race, that's today because we have cars and computers, everything's so fast. The situation, when I talk about the rat race, the situation where one's life is dominated by greater and greater pursuits to perform, uh, pursuing way too many goals, um, uh, too many family issues, uh, unfortunately, the family becomes neglected because of this, because we're pushed to work harder and longer. But in the end, we gain less and less. You know, we work harder and harder, but we have less and less satisfaction. Something, something wrong there. Our, our culture thinks that it invented the rat race mentality. However, in Solomon's comments in chapter nine, verses 11 to 18, we see that even people who lived almost 3,000 years ago suffered from the same kinds of problems. I think that's one of the most valuable things we get from uh, Solomon's writings is that the things we do today very much existed you know, when, uh, when he was writing his books. So Solomon comments, first of all, on the nature of the rat race as he observed it in his day. So let's take a look at the first passage, it would be in Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse 11. And the first thing that he says about the rat race is the rat race is foolish. I quote him, he says, I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors and neither is bread to the wise nor wealth, to the discerning nor favor to the men of ability, for time and chance overtake them all. So even though, he says, some run harder, try harder, wake up earlier, there's no guarantee that this will produce success. The blessings come to the good and the bad, and success also comes to those who deserve it, but it also comes to those who don't deserve it. Solomon says that the work harder, sacrifice everything to get ahead mentality is no guarantee that you will succeed. God's sovereign, meaning you know when he says time and chance there, God's sovereign hand can level the playing field at any time, at any time. We go on verses uh, 12 to 13, next thing he says about the, uh, the rat race, trusting in your ability is also foolish. He says, moreover man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun and it impressed me. So the entire rat race mentality is based on the false notion that only the strong survive. But if, you are, you know, if you're clever and knowledgeable and educated and if you have influence, then you will get ahead and this will make you happy and this will be satisfying to you. 
Solomon says that trouble and death, they know no difference between wise and simple. Everybody suffers from trouble and everybody dies, no matter who you are. Being first in line doesn't guarantee happiness and it doesn't protect you from sickness and death. You know, I remember, we remember Princess Diana, even those who are young here, they, they still talk about her, Princess Diana in England. She was killed in a car crash in, uh, in London, very tragic thing. The interesting thing about Diana and that car crash is that she was riding in a Mercedes S280 sedan, the most safe vehicle in the world. Eight advanced safety features, crumple resistant, multiple airbags, I mean, it had everything. The only thing that that car could not do safety wise, put your seatbelt on for you. And the coroner, uh, you know, the report came out, the reason she died, she was sitting in the back seat on top of that, the safest place to be in the car for an adult. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt. She wasn't wearing her seatbelt. She had all the protection that a person can have in a vehicle. But in a moment of, you know, you know, one of those moments we have, she forgot to put her seatbelt on. The coroner says that because the roof crumpled, you know, she went up, she died in that fashion. Usually the rush to be first brings on most of our trouble. Because I'm going to be first, I'm going to get to the top first, and a lot of times getting to the top first means stepping on other people. That's not a good thing. So Solomon, you know, he knew this. There's nothing new about that type of mentality. Next thing is comment on the rat race. Those who remain in the race remain fools, he says. Verse 14, 15, he says, there was a small city with few men in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man. He tells the story of a wise king who saved his city from attack, only to be rejected and forgotten for his efforts. So what's the point? Well, the point is, um, uh, the, the, uh, is that it illustrates the, the mindless and foolish attitude of those caught in the rat race. They have a near-death experience and are miraculously saved, because in the story he tells a little parable there, there's no army, just the wisdom of one man, and yet the experience doesn't change them in any way. <laughs> they go right back to their pursuits, even forgetting to honor the one who saved them. So the rat race makes people self-centered and insensitive to spiritual things. When I say spiritual things, this whole city nearly died. They were nearly destroyed. And when they were saved, they didn't change anything. We've known people like that. How many, I think we've all seen these, you know, they have these commercials for cigarettes or anti-smoking commercials. And I think the most gruesome image that you see in the anti-smoking commercial is the guy who's lost his voice, no voice box, you know, because of throat cancer, and has to have a, he has a hole in his neck, right? And in order to speak, he has to put a, his finger on that hole to be able to speak you know, this very garbly voice. And, and in one of the scenes that I've seen in this anti-smoking commercial, he takes a cigarette and puts it in this hole <laughs> to inhale to more smoke. The very thing that destroyed his health, he can't, you know, hasn't learned by that. So based on these verses and others in the passage, Solomon develops some core ideas about life in the fast lane that helps those in it reconsider their lifestyle. So he, he talks about the foolishness of it, now he's, you know, the negative side, he flips it over, now he's going to talk about some positive things, some things we can learn. First, he says, human activity cannot guarantee genuine success. Verse 11, he says, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors and neither is bread to the wise nor wealth to the discerning nor favor to men of ability for time and chance overtake them all. If you're saying, hey, I thought he already read that. Yes, I did. I'm reading it again 
this time looking at it from another perspective. Point here, we go back to verse 11 to see that despite all human efforts, final success is given to us by God. I've always said the difference in the world between believers and non-believers is that believers thank God for the things that they have and, and, and non-believers don't. Both believer and non-believer receive things from God, blessings from God. The only difference is believers say thank you. you know, it's hard to accept that God even permits evil and selfish people to succeed wildly at times, but remember that their success is short-lived and it's only limited to this world. It's like you better enjoy it now because that's all you got. The true success in living is found in the degree of peace and joy and love that we achieve and no amount of talent or hard work guarantees these things to us. Peace, inner peace, true inner peace and joy, true joy. Those things, God gives us those things. We don't earn those things. We can't make those things happen. Another insight he provides. Strength is more impressive, yes, less effective than wisdom. Now, I want to just make a little parenthetical statement here. He doesn't say, okay, everybody in the fast lane, all the people who are busy, blah, 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 you got to stop doing that. You, you got to get out of the fast lane. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. But what he's saying is, here are the foolish things that people in the, in the fast lane, in the rat race, don't realize. And then he says, if you're going to be in the fast lane, here's some things that you need to remember so you don't allow the fast lane to completely destroy your life. So the second thing he mentions is that strength is more impressive yet less effective than wisdom. Verse 9, 15 and 16a says, but there was found in it a poor wise man and he delivered the city by his wisdom, yet no one remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom, is better than strength. We have power, uh, it's display and exercise, but wisdom is always a more useful and profitable asset. The United States, for example, is the most powerful country in the world. It is, still, no matter what the papers say. That's just politics, but economically we still make more stuff and ship more stuff than everybody else. We still have bigger army, better army. You know, we still the most powerful country in the world. But what is required to make peace and to maintain relationship with other countries? You have to have wisdom as well. You have to know how to deal with certain nations because some nations, they don't care if you're strong. They're, they're, they'll, you know, they'll annihilate themselves just to, get, to, to, to try to take you out. So we love power and we love to display power, but, 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 but uh, Solomon says wisdom is a more useful asset. The rat race moves us to acquire power, not wisdom. You know, we are stronger than both Israel and the Palestinians, right? We're stronger than both those nations, right? And yet, despite our strength, we have not yet the wisdom to figure out how to bring peace to those, to those nations. It's not power that's going to bring peace there. It's wisdom that's finally going to bring peace. I have other comments on that, but I'll, we'll save that for another time. Wisdom is not acquired by doing, but rather by listening. When we shift gears to pursue wisdom, we take the first step in getting out of the rat race or the rat race mentality. Another thing he says, wise counsel is not usually popular, rarely obeyed and seldom remembered. He says, but the wisdom of the poor man is despised and his words are not heeded. You know, it's a pessimistic observation, but a true one. Historians say the value of the study of history is for what? that we not re repeat the mistakes of the past. It's within human sinful nature to continually forget the lessons of the past and the people who helped us. Just a reading about Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, England uh, at the time of the war, Second World War, and if you read about him, you find out that single-handedly, man, uh, he, he, he inspired his people you know, to resist and, 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 and to 
to survive in the war. Some, some historians say that he single-handedly saved his country by the decisions he made, the wisdom that he had, the courage that he had. He saved his nation. And during the war years, you know, uh, people were rallying around uh, him and, and the leadership that he was providing. He had a, like a 90% approval rating. I mean, what politician ever has a 90% approval rating? Once the war was over, he lost the election. There was another election after the war was over and the, you know, the Germans signed a surrender treaty, the Japanese signed a surrender treaty. Whoa, the war is won, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, time to get rid of that guy. <laughs> so people don't listen and they sure don't appreciate. So the implicit advice here is to continually review and reaffirm the, uh, the wise counsel and the instruction that we've received from wise people in order to succeed. Success is not just based on doing, it's also based on listening and remembering, according to Solomon. Number four, he says, human rulers will always shout down wise counselors and fools like it this way. According to Solomon, the words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. The rat race is noisy, that's the point. And most like it this way so they don't have to be distracted by another message or another way. In our society, the rat race has one more meeting or one more thing to buy or one more holiday to get ready for. This kind of, quote, noise drowns out the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit within us and sometimes the voice of our conscience or our heart's true desire. And we just keep you know, trucking along anyway, as long as I'm busy, as long as I'm you know, doing my to-do list, Got to have, you know, got to understand the difference, you know, the difference between activity and joy or satisfaction and, 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 and peace of mind, not the same thing. Satisfaction is I get to check off stuff off my to-do list. That's satisfaction. Is that wrong? No, it's, it's normal. Ah, I feel good. Mow the lawn, everything is good. You know, trim the hedges, picked up the clippings. Oh man, and, and what could be better? The guys from the the spray, they came to spray and the, it rained that afternoon. Life is so good. I don't have to get out there and water. Check, ah, feeling good. Well, that's okay, the to-do list. That, that's called satisfaction. But please don't confuse that satisfaction with peace of mind. They're not the same. Peace of mind, you never arrive at peace of mind by doing. Number five, wisdom is better than war. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. If everybody listened to wisdom, there would be no wars, but one fool can easily destroy what 10 wise persons can build. I mean, you know, again, since we're in the World War II framework here, remembering? How about people who have led their nations to destruction? Hitler, one man, one man who just rose to power at the right time, you know, confluence of, 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 of uh, events taking place, you know, the perfect historical political storm brought this one guy to rulership and look at what has happened because of him. Oof. The emperor of Japan, during World War II, his nation was defeated. They had lost everything. Their navy was done. They, they, they had no anti-aircraft artillery. The, the Allied, you know, the American Air Force was going in unimpeded. They were flying bombing raids over Japan. They weren't, they weren't even worried about anybody shooting at them because they had no weapons left. And yet they, the, the emperor would not surrender, thinking that you know, because he, was, you know, he thought he was God, the people thought he was God. He thought, there's no way, it's impossible for me to lose. What happened to his nation? Well, you know, they dropped the atom bomb on them to tell them, look, you stop already. 
In our lives, the same is true. One foolish act or one foolish person, uh, uh, one time we compromise wisdom can lead to the destruction of much good. We have to be careful. One stupid thing we say or do destroys a career, destroys a marriage. That's why he says wisdom is better than war. So now that he has commented on the foolishness of the rat race itself and the advantage of opting out for a wiser course of living, Solomon builds a continuing case for wisdom. First thing he says about wisdom, well, he contrasts wisdom and folly. The contrasting of these two traits can uh, be broken down into three main sets of comparisons. First, the advantage and disadvantage of wisdom. So he says, dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. So I'm repeating what I just said. Be careful because just a little foolishness can ruin a lifetime of wisdom. Right, one stupid thing we say, one foolish act that we do destroys something that we've built. Other thing that he says, a wise man's heart directs him towards the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. So here, right personifies honor and strength, left, foolish and ruin. So a constant practice of foolish or wisdom, actions or thoughts, will bring a constant reward of success or ruin. If you're constantly making right decisions, well, you know, your life is going to be better. If you're constantly making bad decisions, well, you'll bear the consequences of, of that. In verse three, he says, even when the fool walks along the road, he's, his sense is lacking and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. So eventually, fools have the reputation of being so and wise men have the reputation of being so. You know, as he walks along the road, everybody knows, well, eventually everybody knows, oh, this guy, you know, don't take this guy's word. Don't trust this guy. Let's not entrust the job to this guy. Let's, uh, you know that. You've worked in offices and you had a job to do. Maybe you're in a supervisory role and you're thinking, okay, who can do this? And you think of uh, person A and then you go, oh, no, no, I, I remember this guy. <laughs> I trusted him last time. What a mess. Spent half the, you know. Well, that's what Solomon is saying. You keep making bad decisions and reacting badly. Well, you know, you'll get the results of that. And another result of that is people will know that you're that kind of person. So that's his first, the advantages of wisdom versus uh, uh, foolishness, the advantages and disadvantages of both. Then he talks about humility and patience versus popularity and partiality. Okay, in verse four he says, if the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. In another place, uh, Solomon says, a soft answer turns away wrath. My wife's favorite passage that she would quote to the children when one of them was beating on the other. Uh, Solomon here shows that wisdom is better at handling difficult superiors than foolishness, which would return heat for heat and unreasonable, unreasonableness for unreasonableness. If your boss is mad at you and makes a foolish accusation against you and you're a hot-tempered fool, what will you do? Well, you'll jump back in his or her face, right? And what, what, what will that cost you? Solomon is saying, if you're wise, if you have wisdom and your boss jumps at you and you're able to kind of hold your composure and answer softly, reasonably, with wisdom, you might be able to absorb that attack without long-term uh, damage to yourself, to your career in this instance, and also uh, ultimately gain the respect of your superior, because your superior is going to walk away and say, okay, this person here uh, you know, is a person of uh, stature. Uh, you know, their estimation of you will, will go up and not, and not down. In verses five to seven he says, uh, there is an evil I have seen under the sun like an error which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places while rich men sit in humble places. I've seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. 
So here, the downside that he talks about here is that many times unqualified people rise to the top and the wise are left at lower positions. Wisdom helps one to understand why this is so and you know, make the best of it. The fool would despair or covet or lose his soul because of it. A third comparison. Inevitable risk versus inexcusable stupidity. He says, he who digs a pit may fall into it and a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stone may be hurt by them, and he who splits logs may be endangered by them. If the ax is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. So in these, these are kind of loose proverbs, kind of strung together here. Solomon is showing that there are consequences to actions. If you dig a pit, you risk falling into it. His point is that the fool doesn't measure the risk well and usually ends up getting hurt, whereas the wise person will take a risk, but it'll be a calculated risk, a calculated risk. And so with these contrasts, Solomon is trying to demonstrate the advantages of pursuing and implementing wisdom in one's everyday life by contrasting it to foolishness and the results of foolishness. In verse um, 10 to 13, um, or 10 to 11 rather, he says, wisdom has the advantage of giving success. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. So he, um, he sounds out his thoughts by saying that wisdom is superior because it gives superior results in the long run. Fools succeed for a while, that's true, but eventually the wise will win out. And uh, his final example is the one of the careless snake charmer who is bitten by his own snake. <laughs> the idea being his foolishness, you know, the foolishness that you have will bite you in the end. You know, what good is it if you're, gonna, if you're a snake charmer and the, and the snake bites you, uh, you, you, nobody's going to put any money in your basket. <laughs> they came to see you charm the snake, not to see you get bit by the snakes. Although today with YouTube, probably the, the one, you know, the video of the guy getting bit by the snake would garner more, more attention. So then he finishes up verses 12 to 20, a fool's portrait, he draws a portrait. He's talked objectively about wisdom and folly, but now he's going to become more personal as he describes the fool himself. What does a fool look like? Solomon describes him in detail at the end of the chapter. The character of a fool. Now in other places, Solomon has previously described the character of a fool. For example, he says his language is one of disbelief in a psalm. Uh, we read, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And then they are corrupt, they have committed abominable deeds, there is no one who does good. David is talking about this. Because of this, they can live comfortably in a world without God. So one of the things about fools is they don't believe. Secondly, he loves sin. He says the wisdom of the sensible is to understand his way. But the foolishness of fools is deceit. Fools mock at sin but among the upright there is good will. And then in another proverb, the foolishness of man ruins his way and his heart rages against the Lord, Proverbs 19.3. So what's the other characteristic of the fool according to Solomon? Well, he lies easily, he has no conscience, he easily offends God. When the Bible talks about a fool, it doesn't simply refer to a joker or a simple-minded person, but rather a godless sinner who enjoys sin and disbelief. They revel in their disbelief. They're proactive when it comes to sin. That's the fool. So then we talk about the actions of a fool. What do fools do? Now that we've seen some of Solomon's other comments about the character of a fool, let's review what he says about the actions of a fool, get back to our own passage here. First thing about the fool, there's foolish talk. Back to Ecclesiastes, this time chapter 10. It says, words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly and the end of it is wicked madness. Yet the fool multiplies words. So the wise create 
goodness and wisdom with their words, but the fools simply create problems. In other words, the more they talk, the more trouble they cause. Number two, they have an unsure future. No man knows what will happen and who can tell him what will come after him. So they have an unsure future. Their foolish actions will get them into jail or hospital or unemployed or unmarried. A fool's future is uncertain and painful. And you know the way that Solomon is writing here, he starts talking about fools, but he doesn't repeat the idea of fool in every verse. You, know, you need to assume this is the subject matter and then everything after that in the passage is talking about, is talking about fools, whether he repeats the term or not. A third thing about them, they are their own worst enemy. The toil of a fool wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. The image is of a person who works hard for nothing or for stupid results. You know, I, these movies, and I mean, even in real life, you know, they have these things about, they, they show you know, crooks, dumb crooks, the, the dumb things that, like one guy goes into a bank and he, he writes, this is a hold up, you know, give me the money on a slip of paper and the girl gives him the money and he runs away and the cops come and, uh, and they're looking at all the evidence and they say, show us the piece of paper that he wrote it on. Well, yeah, well the guy wrote it on one of his own deposit slips that conveniently had his name and address and phone number on it. So the cops just went, uh, are you Mr. Jones? Yeah, come with us. <laughs> That's a true story, by the way, I read that. So you know, the dumb things that crooks do, well, Solomon is talking similarly of that. You know, uh, and the talk about does not know how to go to a city. Cities were highly visible in those days, usually built uh, up on a hill. To not know how to get there was the ultimate put down that you didn't know your right from your left. In other words, clueless, you're clueless. You don't know, you can't even get to town by yourself. Actions of a fool. They also make poor leaders, verse 16 and 17. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the, at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. So some fools, you know, they get to be leaders, but heaven help the family or the church or the corporation or the country that get a fool for a leader. Don't expect leadership, only trouble from one such person. You know, doesn't know when to eat, drinks in the morning, you know, drinks alcohol in the morning, eats at any time, meaning the schedule is all upside down, there's no order to their life. That's, that's the image that he's painting. They also waste time and money. Through in indolence, the rafters sag, and through slackness, the house leaks. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. They let things go. They can't make decisions. They put off action until it's too late. They love to enjoy themselves and think that money is the answer to everything. That's why they're always broke. <laughs> Sometimes money isn't, the th more money is not the answer. Sometimes prudence is the answer. Sometimes spending less is the answer. You know, sometimes uh, unburdening yourself of, of too many commitments, that's, that's the answer. So Solomon ends the passage in verse 20 by warning his readers that fools can be dangerous, so don't let him become your enemy by complaining about him. And it gets back because he, 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 he loves to do revenge. So how to deal with a fool, that's how we'll wrap it up today. Although it's not contained in the chapter, Solomon does give advice on how do we deal with fools in our own lives. First of all, he says, isolate them. Uh, in Proverbs 14, he says, leave the presence of a fool or you will not discern words of knowledge. And then in uh, 23, nine, do not speak in the hearing of a fool for he will despise the wisdom of your words. So if they continue, leave their presence, isolate them. No use reasoning with a fool. The best method is to allow them to face the consequences of their foolishness. Pain is the only language that fools understand. Second thing, piece of advice. Restore them only if there's evidence of repentance and brokenness. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His loving kindness and for His wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful 
singing. Uh, these, uh, I've read Psalm 107 and 39 and 40 shows that God allows fools to suffer before coming to their rescue. You know, fools love to lie, so it's okay to require solid fruit of their repentance before restoring them to their former place. And then one last thing he gives. Um, when restored, proclaim the change. This is in Psalm 107, it says, when they are diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt upon princes and makes them wander in pathless wasteland. So the foolish are restored, um, is able to witness about his change um, and announce his, re uh, his uh, restoration. Fools who are turned around can be powerful witnesses for the grace of God and the power of his wisdom. And that's kind of a, not just a general lesson about you know, people in business and so on and so forth. It's, it's actually a lesson to the church. Somebody who's acted in a foolish and sinful way um, and they want to be restored. It's okay to ask, how have you, you, know, how have you changed? What have you done to uh, uh, change your ways or to make right what you have uh, done wrong? Uh, okay, so that's uh, Ecclesiastes chapter nine and 10. We're going to finish up next week's our last lesson on this and Lord willing, I'll be here to do that. So thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.